Hello, my name is Mary Campbell and I'm the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. Welcome to today's Discover SLM talk and I extend a particularly warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. Today is the last talk in this series during which we have shared research by our curatorial team into matters diverse and varied. Keep an eye on the SLM website for new curatorial programs next year or revisit this year's talks via the links on our website. Today's speaker is Dr. Jackie Newling, who has a Le Cordon Bleu master's degree in gastronomy and finds food a fascinating and useful lens into history. Jackie co-curated the Eat Your History, a shared table exhibition at the Museum of Sydney in 2013. And she is the cook in SLM's food heritage blog, The Cook and the Curator. She's also author of the award-winning Eat Your History, Stories and Recipes from Australian Kitchens, a book which makes an ideal Christmas gift and can be purchased on our website. For today's talk, Jackie celebrates the joys of Christmas, colonial style, where traditional festivities took on their own flavour, but the Christmas pudding reigned supreme. If you have a question for Jackie, add it to the Zoom chat and she'll answer it at the end of the talk. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Nerida and Warami. Welcome, everybody. I am speaking to you today on Wongal country, uh, and I acknowledge that this land was never ceded. And I pay my respects to Australia's First Nations people, past and their elders past, present and emerging. Coming together to celebrate seasonal change um, and special occasions is shared across all cultures and Christmas in Australia has taken on its own flavour. Even so, our shops are filled with products and packaging adorned with characters and motifs and foods from the Northern Hemisphere. Some of us might think of them as traditional classics passed on through the generations, while others regard them as commercial cliches that play uh, um, on romantic notions of a fairy tale past. The red and the green, the snow and the mistletoe, charming families in their Sunday best, exchanging gifts piled under an evergreen tree and gathered around tables laden with festive fare. I'm just going to share some slides or share my screen. So bear with me just a sec. So you get some visual ideas of these. Sorry, just find my spot. Wait a minute, I've lost my place. There we go. And I'm going to turn my camera off, I think, to save bandwidth. Thank you for bearing with me there. The ideas of a traditional Christmas became entrenched in the 19th century, shaped by popular culture, but also with the influence of German traditions into England, encouraged by Queen Victoria, whose husband, Albert, was German. You can see in this image, uh, a sort of the family gathered around the tree, which has obviously become ubiquitous in uh, all our Christmas celebrations, it seems. But if you look carefully around the edges, you see a lot of other detail going on. There are motifs of people uh, uh, in those little uh, corners here of people who are less fortunate and people receiving, receiving gifts from others or assistance. You see a cornucopia of fresh produce, fresh fruit, grapes, peaches, oranges, and abundant fish, game, birds, and animals, all obviously intended for the Christmas table. Further entrenching our ideas of Christmas is the Book of Christmas, published in 1837 by Harvey Thomas Kibble. Uh, it featured illustrations by Robert Seymour, who also worked with Charles Dickens. The book gives comprehensive detail of the customs, ceremonies, traditions, superstitions, fun, feeling, and festivities of the Christmas season. 
with depictions of the rich shopping, drinking, dining and delighting and jovial entertainment around a roaring fire. Such is the Christmas that colonial Australians, particularly of Anglo-Celtic heritage, yearned for. Newly arrived colonists lament the various customs that they'd formerly experienced or old hands and currency lass, lads and lasses imagined, imagined a gentler, more refined and dignified Mother England. But is this really the case? Certainly, many visitors to the colonies found the concept of a hot summery Christmas peculiar and remarkable. And many did lament the sense of loneliness separated from their extended families back home. But others, clearly relished the warmth and ease that summertime brought while observing many of the old world traditions that could be emulated or replicated despite being on the other side of the world. You can see here people frolicking in a ferny glade um, in, this is in Victoria. Uh, and of course the weather dictated what um, festivities took place um, no matter where you were. But rather than suffer in the heat and stay inside the way that the Victorian Christmas was depicted, colonists took their celebrations outside, finding, a, as I said, a fanny glade or trying to find a stream, a waterhole, a river, or even the harbour side. And although the costuming looks uncomfortably hot, there's often focus on the recreational activities. A cricket bat in front of the tree on your right shows that makeshift games in the backyard after lunch have a long tradition in Australia. And there's almost always a spread of food. The picnic cloth here is adorned with a pineapple, emphasising the idea of, tropic, of the tropics and sunshine. Note also the basket in the lower right corner, complete with cloth and cutlery. And similarly, in this illustration, of a jolly Australian Christmas. There's even a cruet set and wine glasses. This is no crude Bushman setting. Leisure, pleasure and grace are the order of the day, enjoying, enjoying the colony's natural attributes. There's more fun and games happening here. Again, you can see just under the heading there, Christmas uh, in Australia, there's more cricket going on. Uh, we have people playing croquet, uh, the top right, and sort of hoop game on, on ladies playing a hoop game on the left, as well as fishing, hunting, uh, rowing, very much a le leisure time atmosphere. Throughout the century, illustrated newspapers reminded readers of how lucky they were in Australia with this land of warmth and leisure, whether it was um, making direct comparisons to the, that world back home, that idea of the motherland. Instead of skating on thin ice, perhaps, <laughs> with the holly, we see some ladies at leisure taking tea on their harbourside setting. And instead of struggling through the snow with their umbrellas against the wind and the rain, we have sunny parasols uh, as people meander down colonial streets. Ice skating again, the perils of ice skating are shown on the left. While meanwhile, while in Sydney, and this is actually Parramatta apparently in the background, you can see the church there. People are leisurely picnicking. The bush does play a part. And in this uh, image, you see the lonely shepherd dreaming of a Christmas at home, which is suggesting grand England. But on the right, uh, on the other side, on the left, we see Christmas, a very jovial affair with lots of toasts going round in bumpers in the hut. Here again, we see a bushland setting with uh, people in the background picnicking and they've got, you know, their wine out and looking <laughs> rather, rather gracious. While the little girl in the foreground is offering this bushman a slice of plum pudding to enjoy with his pannikin of Billy boiled tea. I'm going to turn my attention to the Christmas pudding in a minute, but here also, see, note the display of wildflowers and foliage that decorate the card. They add festive cheer 
And although bringing the outside in was a tradition in, the, in England, um, and the colonists made great celebration of native flora, such as these depicted in, this, in these works, sorry, botanical works by Harriet Scott, featured on Christmas cards in our Carolyn Simpson Library collection. So now the colonial Christmas menu. In the Book of Christmas, Kibble writes of old Christmas, when the cooks shall be busied by day and by night in roasting and boiling for taste and delight, plum pudding, goose, capon, minced pies and roast beef. By the 1830s, when the book was published, the goose was now outdated, replaced by the more fashionable turkey, and the roast beef was eclipsed by ham. I find this interesting as for quite some time, and for so some time later, turkey and ham appear on menus of, on all sorts of occasions, weddings and balls, not just Christmas. But it's these that have remained as standard Christmas fare today. And note also, <laughs> the Christmas pudding front and centre. Both at home and or both back home and in the colony. Market lists show a plethora of other meat and poultry and in many ways the colonial offer was wider than ours today. At the Sydney markets in 1843 there were geese, ducks, fowls, generally meaning chicken, um, but there could be other ones like um, guinea fowl perhaps, turkeys, quails, pigeons, which usually were put into pies, and snipe, which is a, a, a waterfowl or game bird. And note also rabbits, which in the 1840s were not yet feral and maintained some prestige. They were bred for the table. Butcher's meat included beef, mutton, veal and pork, while hams were on a separate list of imported goods from York in England or Westphalia in Germany, both premium hams of their day. Colonists who kept pigs would have cured their own hams, however, so they weren't just imported. Visitors to the Vaucluse House Kitchen Garden will recognise many of the vegetables on this list, along with salad leaves that were not robust enough to trade commercially, but people definitely grew their own. It's interesting to see pomegranates, so trendy now, being sold in the 1840s, along with locusts, which seem quite exotic. Guavas are listed, but no current price given. But cherry guava makes a delicious um, uh, sweet relish, a little bit like we have cranberry sauce today. And don't believe anyone who says colonial food was bland and dull. Here we have garlic, chilli and fresh horseradish to give things a kick. I chose an 1840s list because account ledgers kept by the Wentworths at Forcluse House have survived from this time. They show that Christmas bonuses were given to various staff, including by order of Mr Wentworth. Harriet received um, three shillings, uh, uh, sorry, three pounds, two shillings and six. Louisa, seven and six. Mary, nine shillings. John Edwards, two shillings, Mary Winters three, and there was snuff for the coachman, two and six. In December 1844, the Wentworths, in the same, um, same journals, the Wentworths purchased over 70 pounds of dried fruit, sultanas, raisins and currants in the months leading up to Christmas. They purchased more modest quantities in January, so they must have used their pre-Christmas stores. The same ledger shows that they bought their mince pies, so it's more likely they were making cakes and puddings, possibly as gifts for their workers as well as for family consumption. Cakes could also be bought locally from specialty pastry shops and confectioners, and it's possible that for the mince pies, their cook didn't have the skills to make a delicate pastry. It's common to hear people say that these festive fruit preparations need to be made well ahead of time, but this was not the way in the 1800s, it seems. In 1850, Annabella Boswell wrote of her Christmas at Lake Innes, visiting the Maclay family of Elizabeth Bay House fame. On Monday the 23rd, we were all up early. I made some shortbread and got ready the plum 
scraps for the mince pies and all the other ingredients for them and for the sponge cakes and delivered them to James, the cook, who has made all the cakes this year and does it very well. On Christmas morning, I was up before five o'clock, not because I had anything to do. I did not even witness the making of the plum pudding, but I was chief maker of the old man's milk, which is a little bit like an eggnog type, um, type festive drink. We dined in the schoolroom, which had been decorated with green boughs and was really very cool. So if you've not made your Christmas pudding yet, there's still time. Because Mrs. Beaton says, in December, the principal household duty lies in preparing for the creature comforts of those near and dear to us. So as to meet old Christmas with a happy face, a contented mind and a full larder, and in stoning the plums, washing the currants, cutting the citron, beating the eggs and mixing the pudding, we greet the genial season of all good things. Sydney Living Museums has several pudding recipes in its collections, handwritten and of course many from published cookbooks. It's difficult to date them all, but the selection I'm going to show you, most of the ones I'm going to show you now, appear to have been documented in the mid to mid 1800s to the 1870s and others date to the early 20th century. Some are hard to read. Uh, this one's Xmas or plum puddings. This one is for plum puddings. And you, we start to see, you know, quite a lot of consistencies, raisins, currants, suet, flour, citron, lemon. This one has an orange uh, and two and a half bottles of port wine. It also has 22 eggs, which is pretty excessive, and some moist sugar. This is a much more abridged version, uh, and you'll note that it doesn't really have any instructions, uh, just lists the ingredients here. It was such an understood thing, pudding making, that often cooks didn't re require to have it written down. This is another. Uh, very similar ingredients, though it has um, treacle in it and a bottle of brandy and a bottle of port wine. Uh, it's a much larger quantity and it asks to be boiled for 12 hours. Similarly here, this is one of my favourites, Grandmama's Christmas Plum Pudding, and it's my favourite because it is dated the 25th of December, 1877. So somebody's written it out for someone who's obviously asked for the recipe. Again, the classic suet, raisins, currants, finest flour crossed out, and I'll talk about that in a minute, breadcrumbs, citron, orange, treacle, 12 eggs, half a bottle of brandy and half a bottle of port wine. Again, boil six hours. I'm quite fond of that recipe because it crosses out the, the flour. The pudding that I make each year, and I've tested a lot of them, contains no flour and no sugar. It's taken from Mrs. Beaton's um, Book of Household Management, which was published in 1861. And again, it has raisins, currants, mixed peel, breadcrumbs, suet, eight eggs, a wine, and a wine glass full of brandy. These are others uh, from later on, and you can start to see that sugar is uh, in this one, um, as well as flour and breadcrumbs, but also some carb soda. And this is a much later one, but it does date to um, the turn of the century, uh, but it was passed on through the family and typed up by the next generations. So let's just talk about the boil six hours. It seems quite an arduous task, and certainly Mrs Cratchit here from Dickens' A Christmas Carol <laughs> is struggling uh, to put her um, her putting in the copper. A lot of us have um, told of people's memories of their grandmother or their mother uh, lighting the laundry copper to cook the pudding because it was so large. And as you saw from some of, that, some of those recipes, they were made in huge quantities. Not all of them were made into one giant pudding. Um, I find it's, if you have a large, um, large batch, it's better to make a few small ones so that you can sort of stretch them out across time. 
But this is quite an innovative, um, you know, in Australia to have a pudding boiling for six hours can get quite hot and steamy, especially if you're in a small house without any air conditioning, which of course there was none in the 19th century. Uh, this is a fantastic um, DIY pudding steamer that was um, probably created in the depression, but used right up into the 20th century. Um, it's a converted tin bucket with different plates that can be set at different levels. And in fact, two puddings were cooked in it at one time. There were concessions also for austerity. So if um, eggs were in short supply, this recipe is from the Marugal collection. And it uses sago, which again is a sort of ingredient that's disappeared from our, um, our pantries today. Uh, but the sago helped do the job of the egg. So as I say, um, I've converted the, um, the Mrs. Beaton's plum pudding recipe. You can find it in our Eat Your History book, but also in the Cook and the Curator blog. And it's actually quite simple to make. Uh, the dried fruit, the breadcrumbs. I've changed, uh, I've replaced the suet with butter because I think that's a little more palatable for us these days and certainly a lot easier to get. Um, and of course, your classic spices, mixed spice, nutmeg, cinnamon, brandy, all those flavours of Christmas. So if you haven't make your pud made your pudding yet, there is still time. So to conclude, many Australians today have broken with these traditions, decorating their homes with native Christmas bush and serving fresh seafood and pavlova with seasonal berries um, and enjoying platters of mangoes and cherries in preference to decking the halls with boughs of holly and dining on roast turkey, cranberry sauce, plum pudding and custard. It could actually be argued that those breakaways are actually following a much more entrenched tradition, making use of and celebrating what is locally available and in season rather than hanging on to the traditions of other places. So I might finish there, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to join the chat. Seems a shame to turn that screen off. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. I hope everyone's Where had afternoon tea. <laughs> Where are the sixpences? Ah, oh, I'm glad you asked that. Yes, um, the sixpences became a tradition in the 20th century, actually. So they do date back to a, a much, much older tradition of when uh, people put little tokens um, in, in puddings uh, and desserts um, in Northern Europe. And that tradition was revived in the early 20th century in America, it seems, and then came to us in the 1930s. And of course, it had to be a sixpence because it is silver and won't taint the pudding. If you use a copper coin, people could get a little uh, quite unwell. Oh, so, <laughs> but it, I remember my, my mother put them in the pudding until she broke her tooth on one. So <laughs> oh. putting, putting foreign objects into food is a good idea. <laughs> Never. We've got a few questions coming through, Jackie. Um, Louise says, the recipe seemed to be from the middle classes. What was convict fare like? Uh, look, it depends how far you want to go back, but um, the convicts were um, often given plum pudding uh, on Christmas Day. And we know that the um, when the barracks opened, for example, uh, at the inaugural feast, the convicts were given plum pudding to have with their beef. So uh, that was in 1819. We also know that the um, immigrant at the immigration depot with the barracks became a, um, a home for destitute women and an asylum in the 1870s and 80s. Um, they were given plum pudding at Christmas. So I think there were different uh, levels of richness. They might not have had the brandy, they might not have had the spice, but it was still, um, it was still very customary to serve it to all classes. It's nice to think the Hyde Park Barracks inhabitants got to have plum pudding too for their Christmas and special celebrations. Um, Hayley would like to know, what did people serve with pudding back then? Was it custard or brandy butter or was there something else? Oh, so you might have seen on that bright yellow page, uh, Mrs Beaton um, 
gives a, a plum pudding sauce, which is brandy and Madeira, which is a little bit like sherry, sort of sweet, sweet wine, and sugar and butter. So you melt the butter with all the alcohol in it and it becomes a pourable sauce. So it's sort of like a, a hot um a hot brandy butter. It's quite wicked, I must say. Um, <laughs> the custard uh, or the creme anglaise, again, I think that's a 20th century um, uh, addition. So often it was, um, it was uh, melted butter sauces were, were very common um, in the 1800s and, and it only sort of became when the French people were emulating French style cookery that these more sophisticated sauces came through. Now to ask you a contentious question, basin or cloth? Oh, okay. Yes, I, I skimmed over that. Uh, look, I tend to use a basin. Uh, the cloth is probably more traditional, and we saw that in Mrs. Cratchit's, um, you know, the Dickens story. Uh, but I think, you know, we've got to remember this is a cold climate dish, and a cloth pudding needs to hang uh, for a couple of weeks to dry out. And in our humidity, I've had some sort of unpleasant experiences with the cloth just going a bit icky. Um, and, you know, you've put all that time and you've put that effort in and all that boiling. You really don't want it to, a disappointment on Christmas Day. So uh, I find the, the pudding basin a bit more reliable for, for our, our, you know, for our contemporary cooking. Fair enough. Julie has a question for you. Are many of the ingredients chosen because of lack of refrigeration? Yes, so it wasn't just lack of refrigeration, it was also seasonal. So again, it, uh, you know, in the wintertime or in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, there really wasn't a lot of fresh fruit around. You probably had lemons, you might have had some, um, uh, you know, apples, more sort of wintertime fruit or sturdy fruit that would keep um, from the autumn harvest. Uh, but that's why the dried fruit was so important. So they were available uh, all year round, but particularly in the wintertime. But then flip that to Australia, and again, they store really well. Actually, dried fruit is a very sustainable product, um, and we're lucky to have Australian-grown dried fruit now, but um, they were importing a lot of dried fruit into the colony um, in the 1800s, and it stored, they stored beautifully without needing refrigeration. So it's actually a very, very practical dish in many ways. It is. Uh, and another question. And do you, um, this is again from Julie, and do you give your pudding a big drink of brandy or other grog? <laughs> Every day, one for you, one for the pudding. <laughs> we seem to have an obsession with alcohol, don't we, in Australia, and that idea of feeding the pudding. And I think if you do make your pudding uh, well in advance, um, it is, you know, you don't want it to dry out. So uh, adding, adding brandy or sherry or rum, whatever your chosen um, grog, uh, is is probably um, a, a good idea, uh, but in the uh, Mrs. Beaton recipe that I use, it has half a cup of brandy in it already, and you can, you know, really that flavour really does come through uh, in the cooking. And I've made it with rum, and it really, you know, it, it takes on a, a completely different personality. So those those sort of things are entirely up to you. And there are some people these days who are trying to avoid any alcohol for various reasons. And in that case, I say don't, well, you know, you still need the liquid content, but it's actually quite nice to use an Earl Grey tea or a Lady Grey tea or, you know, a fragrant tea in its place. Very nice. Have you made your puddings? I have had puddings on the boil <laughs> this whole weekend. We did a fantastic workshop out at um, Forclues House on Sunday. We had Christmas uh, at Forclues and I did a cooking demonstration there and, of course, came home and it's been on the it's been it's had a good six hours boiling on the stove in the last uh, last couple of days awesome well thanks Jackie that's all we've got time for today um, thanks again everyone for joining us for these talks we really appreciate your interest and the enthusiasm for the work of SLM and we hope to see you at our properties and events in the new year Check our website for details about property opening hours and a selection of our innovative, fun and thought-provoking programs. Have a wonderful festive break and a happy new year. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas.